uh, event uh, uh, from the Center for Future Consciousness. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is uh, having a, a discussion on science fiction books made into movies. And um, in case you are not familiar uh, with the series, um, I've been doing a series on the evolution of science fiction. It's a webinar series. And all of the uh, previous uh, webinars in this series uh, are up on uh, YouTube on the Center for Future Consciousness YouTube channel. And uh, I'm Tom Lombardo, the director of the Center for Future Consciousness. And I've been a lifelong, uh, since I was probably seven or eight years old, fan of science fiction. And um, I'm a uh, executive board member of uh, the World Future Study Federation and uh, been an active futurist for maybe 25, 30 years. And that's just a brief introduction for people who don't know me. Now, Hank's going to introduce himself. Yeah, for some people who don't know me, I'm Hank, uh, a long time fan of science fiction, a uh, fan of films, TV series, and books. It started when I was six years old, when the, my parents took me to see The War of the Worlds, and uh, I saw red and green flashing lights for weeks after that, and I was hooked. And then on from the to the Twilight Zone and the Outer Limits, to Ray Bradbury, A.E. Van Bocht, and Philip K. Dick. And what really interests me is how science fiction makes thinking about the future more real. Uh, I've got some questions which I've been uh, thinking about when preparing for this webinar. For example, how does popular culture influence the ways we think about the world, the ways we think about society, ourselves, and the other? And what makes a good book good and a good film good? And if the book and film are different, can they both be good? And just a little sidebar before I give the floor back to Tom, uh, I noticed that in some of the LinkedIn invitation texts, my name was misspelled by the uh, AI's so-called uh, intelligence. And there's a good story in there because AI is a great prediction machine predicting the next word in a sentence and the next letter in a word, but somehow it didn't predict uh, Kuhn would be spelled that way. And that's perhaps uh, relevant uh, to some of the themes we'll deal with today. Back to you, Tom. Yes, by the way, the AI also mucked up last and first men, too. On one <laughs> of the um, uh, I want to just mention briefly here, before we move on, um, uh, a, a special request that I have. Um, in uh, three weeks, I'm going to be giving a talk at the World Future Study Federation Conference in Paris. And one of the talks I'm giving is a um, uh, accelerative overview of the evolution of science fiction from ancient to modern times. And they're giving me an hour to do it. And I wanted to practice with a live audience. <laughs> Um, this presentation before I did it in Paris. So for everybody who's attending today, if you're interested in being guinea pigs, an audience listening to me, a week from today at the same time, uh, which would be October the 14th, 10 o'clock Arizona time, we're going to do a, 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 a special event where I'm going to give you the World Future Study Federation presentation with slides. And if you would like to attend, it's free of charge. Uh, I have all of your emails. And so I can send you the uh, link. Uh, Terry will get me the link for it. And you can sign up. And it'll be a week from uh, today. And it's just for me to practice and see if in an hour I can describe the history of science fiction from the Iliad and Prometheus up to um, everything, everywhere, all at once in the three-body problem and everything in between. So uh, to uh, continue with our event today, uh, science fiction books made into movies.
we're going to break this down into four periods. And everyone should have received the uh, list of science fiction books and movie combos. Uh, the early period, the golden and civil age period, the new wave and cyberpunk period, and the new millennium. So we're going to chunk it into four different uh, periods of uh, uh, movie making, beginning with Melies and A Trip to the Moon. Um, and for each of the four periods, Hank and I are going to select out one or two uh, book movie combos of that period and make a few brief remarks as to why we thought those particular combos are significant in the history of uh, science fiction cinema and uh, novel uh, publications. Um, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. So most of each of the four chunks is going to involve your input into that period, movie, book combos that you particularly liked, comments you have to make about them. But Hank and I aren't going to spend too much time talking at the beginning. We're going to leave most of each of the four chunks of this up to you. And we'll take a five-minute break after we uh, finish the Golden and Silver Age and before we go into the New Wave and Cyberpunk period. So on that note, we'll start. We have some questions. Now, the first question is a bit of trivia. What great science fiction movie is this image from? Um, anybody who thinks they have an answer, I think they'll probably find one or two people there. Uh, if you are, if you know they, where this image is from, unmute yourself. And let's see who who can guess this one. Nobody. Does, do you see anybody, Terry, uh, raising their hand? No. Right. I don't, Tom. Uh, okay, I thought I thought maybe Gerald would know this or Leslie, but no, nobody knows this. This is from Fritz Lang and Thea von Harbo's Woman in the Moon, which was the first really realistic depiction of uh, a rocket ship taking off from the Earth and the lunar landscape and exploring the moon with the central character in here being a woman who was right there with her uh, hands stretched out. And notice she doesn't have on any kind of space gear because in this vision from the 1920s, there's air on the moon. <laughs> but a great movie, great movie. And she was just great. The leading actress in this was just great. And this is one of the earliest really classic science fiction novels written by her, Thea von Harbo, made into a movie by her and her husband. So our questions, which book movie combos have most expanded your consciousness and understanding of yourself, the world, the other, and the universe? What are the best book movie combos on the future, space exploration, world catastrophes, aliens, robots, and technology, and dystopian utopian societies? Which books should be adapted into movies but haven't as of yet? And are there book movie combos that we have missed in a compilation? So those are the questions. I think I sent those out on, the, um, on an announcement. This is our first period here. And I have all of the uh, uh, significant uh, uh, movie book combos that I could uh, identify between 1900, A Trip to the Moon by Millier's, which was based actually on two novels, um, uh, From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne and The First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells, all the way up to, uh, I put in Buck Rogers uh, based on Gerald's recommendation, even though Buck Rogers was actually a, a serial, but it was based on the original uh, Buck Rogers stories that came out in 1928-1929, Armageddon 2419, and the Air Lords of Han. So this stretches out here almost 40 years with a variety of different significant movie book combos in there, including Women of the Moon and Woman in the Moon in 1929. Um, now, a picture is worth a thousand words, 
So to stimulate your imagination and thinking, here are movie posters of significant images of all of those movies that I just put up there on the uh, previous list. And um, Hank and I were going to mention a couple of these um, and uh, make some uh, individual comments on them. And uh, the two that um, I was going to comment briefly on, I've already commented a bit on Women in the Moon, but the uh, two that I was going to comment briefly on were Metropolis and uh, Things to Come. Um, first off, you should note here, in this period, four of H.G. Wells' novels or stories were turned into book, uh, turned into movies. In case you haven't ever read The Man Who Could Work Miracles, that was a story by Wells that they turned into a movie. And notice also they did three different versions during this time of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But the two I wanted to highlight were Metropolis and Things to Come. And I wanted to highlight those two because Basically, I think they were the two best science fiction movies of the period, totally different in ways. Uh, both Metropolis and Things to Come were based on books. The book was written by Thea von Harbo for Metropolis, and Things to Come was based upon H.G. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come. And uh, uh, both novels were very impressive. In case you've never read The Shape of Things to Come, it's an incredible example of the comprehensive, intricate intellect of H.G. Wells as a historian, as a futurist, and tying it all in together with a, a science fiction story. He actually was involved in the production of the movie. In case you haven't seen the movie, there are futurists such as um, uh, Wagner who think it is one of the greatest science fiction movies ever made. It's a bit, um, um, let's see, it is incredibly epical and maybe it's a bit pompous, but it's got a lot of interesting special effects and it runs over about a 150 year period. On the other hand, Metropolis and both the movie and the book are very Dionysian as opposed to rational types of depictions of uh, the future. Um, uh, uh, Fritz Lang and, and, and Thea von Harbo in the novel create this very sensationalistic and archetypal and mystical and religious and animated and crazy vision of the near future. Um, and in case you haven't seen the movie, of course, I highly recommend watching it. Uh, the most expensive movie ever made up to that point in time. And in case you've not read the novel, the novel is uh, almost equal in quality to the book, which is an interesting thing since movies often, uh, um, uh, uh, great movies often, maybe the book isn't so hot. But in this case, the book was very, very good. Uh, so two highly recommended movies from that period. Your turn, Ian. Go to it. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I chose to talk about Frankenstein, uh, especially the uh, 1931 uh, film uh, made by James Wales and, of course, the original Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Modern Prometheus from 1818. Well, let's start with the novel. It entered the world as literature and has been taken up in the canon of mainstream literature since then. And I guess 90% uh, of the people in the Western world know what the name Frankenstein means, even if they think the name is the Frankenstein means the monster as opposed to its creator, even if they've never read the book or seen any of the many films. Superficially, Frankenstein, the creature, not the scientist, is iconic, a monster that destroys its creator a monster created from inanimate parts, starting with a criminal's brain and brought to life by electricity, at least in the film. Ugly, 
frightening, a natural born killer. No, I mean, of course, a natural made killer, at least in the film. Of course, the book is more complex. The film, James Whale's film, is visually powerful, reminded me of some of the black white imagery of Metropolis. Unfortunately, Wales is not as good as Fritz Lang, but both Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein are nicely made and made to be shocking. And in fact, the uh, the Frankenstein film from 31 opens with the representative of the film studio on behalf of the producer, giving uh, we innocent viewers a warning. What you will see can be frightening, can be shocking. Beware. And beware we were. We were aware from the 30s and into the 40s and into the 50s of the genre of science fiction as popular entertainment. And, of course, with what both the film and the and the uh, book have in common are the themes, we and the other, the amb ambitious scientist who creates a monster, the other, the scientist who strives to do the impossible and comes to regret it, the obsession with creating something new without considering the consequences. It's a metaphoric marker of some of our civilization's significant moments as we sometimes speak of our Gutenberg moment or our Sputnik moment, but our Frankenstein moment is more powerful and the story is still being told. Perhaps it's also the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the scientists working with him, creating something scientifically advanced, scientifically beautiful, but then once it exists and to their regret, they have no control over it any longer. Of course, for those people alive in the 30s and 40s, this film unlocked a Pandora's box in mass market entertainment. And if you grew up in the 50s, like I did, this meant Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney Jr., Dracula, the Wolfman, and Boris as Frankenstein. Son of Frankenstein, curse of Frankenstein, ghost of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Even Abbott and Costello met him. That's our collective love for this kind of melodrama. It seems insatiable. And the issues it raised are with us even today. Tom, back to you. Okay, so now we're going to open it up. And people want to talk about other movies up here. Uh, make further comments about what we said. Uh, Terry's moderating. So go ahead, Terry. Who has something to say? If you could see everyone. Okay. Now I can see you all. If you raise your hand, I'll call on you. Okay. I see uh, Basil has his hand up. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, my question's for Hank and, and, and Frankenstein. Uh, excuse my, I'm recovering from a, a, a cold, um, my voice. The um, the notion that archetypes recycle and morph and come out of this early period and resurface now, I'm, I'm wondering about your thoughts on the public response to AI in general and kind of like the, the modern Frankenstein. Yeah, I mean, that's very well put. I think for lots of people, uh, AI and its promise and its threat is a kind of recycling of that archetype. And even very respected scientists don't really seem to know enough about what's emerging to take a uh, reasonable or scientific uh, standpoint on it. And I really do like your idea of archetypes recycling. Uh, one of the themes in all the comments I'm going to make today is about the archetype of the other, which went from Frankenstein up into, uh, through Alien, uh, up through uh, Arrival, uh, and the story uh, of our lives by Ted Chang, moving from frightening archetype to something we just don't understand and really want to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Another comment from somebody? 
Nothing right yet? Well, I have a comment to Basil's question yeah. and also the comment on Hank's comment. Um, I should note that Metropolis and Things to Come both involve recurrent general themes of science fiction. In the case of Metropolis, we have a technologically advanced society where the underclass is repressed and does all the work for the upper class, but there is a rebellion that takes place in it. And in the end, the head and the heart unite, or the hand and the head, I forget which one it was. Yes. But we have a positive resolution. Another common theme in science fiction is that we're heading towards some great civilizational disaster and civilization will um, crumble, but out of the ashes will emerge something more advanced, enlightened, and better. That's the shape of things to come. Note that in both cases, even though there is a, uh, a darkness that's presented about the future, in the end, there is an upbeat resolution to it. Civilization rises up out of the ashes and recreates itself, and equality and uh, justice is finally served in the ending of Metropolis. So right now we have lots of pessimistic feelings about our future, and it's not like Lang and Von Harbo and Wells did not see things that were negative in their own particular period, but they saw a possible constructive and upbeat resolution to it at the end. So that's a comment on uh, on recurrent themes, Basil, and also a comment on a, a, a mode of consciousness in the two of them, with Lang and Von Harbo and Wells, that is positive in the end, is constructive in the end. So, uh, other comments on this period on the movies up here? Oh, Jeannie? Yeah, I'm just um, looking at this and thinking that it's interesting the contributions of women in this period as early as it is. And um, the... Uh, would you would you say that um, Metropolis and Elite Goddess of Mars, for example, have a more positive view of of the future or not? What do you think, Hank and Tom, about that? More positive view about women? Women and uh, in general the future. I mean, a lot of these, if you look at um uh me, you know, Invisible Man, Frankenstein. Uh, they're about, you know, the the theme of, uh, you know, don't play around with science. Don't try to be God. Uh, they're motivated out of, I think, a fear of science more than uh, positive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, some comments about women either as writers or characters in these movies, novels. Um, item number one, uh, Thea von Harbo was the writer, primary writer for both of these uh, films and books uh, that her and her husband produced. And Woman in the Moon, the hero of the movie, the central hero of the movie is a woman, not a man, but a woman. She's the one who figures out the challenge, the puzzle, the one with courage, the one with insight. Um, Alita, uh, goddess of Mars, or queen of Mars, um, uh, the, the character in the movie, in case you've never seen this, you should watch this one. This is 1920s communist science fiction. Mm -hmm. Believe it, communist science fiction. But she is one of the most visually, psychologically striking uh, um, uh, characters uh, uh, ever put up on the screen. She is kind of a, 
in the borderland between being crazy, psychotic, obsessed, and colorful. And her costumes are incredible, too. Yeah, yeah. so uh, there was a beep for some reason. So um, um, uh, actually, uh, 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 also something that people may not have seen up here, um, The Tunnel, which is a German um, uh, science fiction novel. And actually, I think there were multiple versions of the movie. This one up here is British. Uh, there's a central woman character in that who's a strong character as well. Um, uh, they played up the um, Panther Woman in the Island of Dr. Moreau made into the Island of Lost Souls. She's a significant woman character too. So I think women are strongly represented both as writers and as characters in these early uh, uh, science fiction novels and um, uh, movies for sure. Uh, they're they're uh, in, in, in a variety of them. Um, um, uh, and we have Ingrid Bergman and Lana Turner and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, as central characters. Yeah. Um, so women very visible early on. Yes. In all of this. Ger Gerald? Yes. Uh, Glenn, very, uh, again, to throw and moon. Uh, but I'm <clears throat> looking at the, you know, that iconic picture of the spaceship uh, going out over this trench filled with water to absorb the impact of the exhaust as the spaceship takes off. And I'm wondering if anybody can think of something very recent <laughs> as to that situation, uh, the lack thereof and the uh, problems that it caused uh, SpaceX and its Starship. But, uh, uh, that there, there was this level of anticipation in Fro and Mond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, are you the, uh, oh, Jeannie has a comment. Just briefly, it made me think, uh, Tom and I right now are watching the series for all mankind, and they have absolutely fabulous visuals of rockets being propelled out of the ocean instead of off of land. Just, just that. Yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, Gerald, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were several significant firsts in that movie, uh, Woman in the Moon, uh, regarding uh, realistic depictions. I, uh, I, for example, I think it's the first movie in which there's a countdown actually in the movie yeah um yeah um uh, in the end i still will go back to it's the the psychological element of that movie that to me seemed most striking but there is a, a good deal of uh um uh, realism and technological inventiveness in uh the, the movie as well yeah for sure um other comments that uh, off of gerald's are there comments Debbie? I put my question in the chat. Can you Would see you... it? I can. Go ahead. Repeat I, it. I could see it. All um, right. Do, do any I'm of these movies... <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Do any of these movies that show civilization rising from the ashes depict or described or depict at a uh, mechanism? Is that by which that happens, or is it magical? Well, not did you understand that? Things to come is not magical. Um, I don't think Metropolis is the the um, the the red the, the positive resolution. I don't think is magical either. It's um, a, a conf in the end. It's a confrontation, personal confrontation in Metropolis between the mad and evil scientists, although there's some mystical and religious things thrown in there along the way. Uh, and um, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't say so, Debbie. Um, uh, the Man Who Could Work Miracles has certain, the movie has certain religious metaphysical elements in it 
uh, in terms of its resolution. But that's about it. Um, yeah, uh, Wells definitely is not being mystical or magical or religious in human civilization rising back up again. Not, not at all. Yeah. Other comments, or we want to move on to the next period? I think we probably should. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Well, we started 10 minutes late. So, any anyway, uh, Jeannie's telling me we should move on. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, here we go. Let's move into the next period the Golden and Silver Age, 1950 to 1970. And here I got them all up there that, um, I was able to identify. Um, I put up Destination Moon, even though, uh, as Gerald and I discussed, or he pointed out, the uh, the novella actually came out after the movie, uh, but still I put uh, that up together. And um, um, any other ones I just want to briefly mention here? No, not at the moment, but here's the pictures. Um, and uh, which is, uh, first of all, the poster from the World of the Worlds. And here's the significant uh, movies and or TV series. Uh, the Machine Stops is a TV episode, uh, but I put it up there uh, too. Now, Hank, do you want to go first this time and comment on whichever ones you want to comment on this list? Yeah, okay. Um, first one in this uh, period I want to comment on is The Thing sometimes known as the thing from another world. Uh, and the film is derived from John Campbell's story, his novella, Who Goes There? The, uh, the novella was 1938, and the first filming of The Thing, 1951. It's been filmed several times since then. But let me talk about... Uh, the 1951 filming. It's a real Hollywood production and a production true to its times in the very early 50s. There's rather too much talking about the being, the people in the film being frightened, but we never really get to see that fright or what frightens them. And finally, we're well on into the film, well over the half, and we finally get to see the silhouette of the creature and it looks very similar to Boris Karloff's uh, Frankenstein monster. So uh, things have not evolved that much about uh, the things that frighten us in the cinema. And of course, here, uh, the thing is a vegetable, very much the other. And in its true Hollywood fashion, uh, that's the secret of destroying it. Uh, what do you do with a vegetable? One of the characters asked, or oh, I think he was a scientist. So one of the few women in the film says, you can boil it, you can stew it or fry it. And that's, of course, what they do. Uh, they destroy it with electricity. Before they're able to do that, the film scientist argues that science needs to study the monster. Nothing is worth more than knowing, he says. Knowledge is more important than life, he says. Does this sound like the message of Victor Frankenstein in the Frankenstein novels? The book, on the other hand, is far deeper and more frightening. Here, the monster is very much a very scary other. It can take on the form of anything it merges with. Antarctic scientist, sled dog, albatross, even an inanimate object. You can never tell if it has merged with your colleague or your companion or your friend. The person himself doesn't know if the monster has merged with him. You can't trust each other. You can't trust yourself. You can't trust anyone. That's the story, that's the message of the novella, Who Goes There? And that's a very frightening thought. And at the end of the film, there's some oddly uplifting messages, very reminiscent of its time. Uh, we fought a battle against, and we won it for the human race. 
This time science saved the world with an arc of electricity like Noah did with an arc of wood. I think you'd have to know the novel to really get the message there. But the final words of the film have a very peculiar message, born perhaps out of 1950 America's fear of communists, very much the other. Watch the skies, the voiceover says. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep watching the skies. They are coming. Is this fear of the other? But not nearly as frightening as the other is in the book. Well, that's one of the book couples I'd like to talk about. There's another one, but maybe I'll give Tom a chance uh, to go before I get to my second example. Yeah. Um, uh, this period is the period during which um, I grew up and watched my first science fiction movies. And there's a whole bunch of them up here that were very memorable to me for different reasons as a uh, young child. The Time Machine, The War of the Worlds, um, The Thing, which uh, Hank just talked about, uh, When Worlds Collide. I should note that during this time, Wells had three more of his uh, novels made into movies. And Jules Verne actually had four or five because The Master of the World is really a combination of two of his novels uh, made into um, movies. Um, the first one I think I'll, I'll mention here, highlight a bit, is um, When Worlds Collide. Um, uh, when Worlds Collide, I must have watched when I was about five or six years old. And it really enthralled me, and it uh, uh, pulled me out of the complacency, uh, compl a complacency of my existence on the Earth. Because in the movie, the Earth ends up getting destroyed, and humanity, what's left of humanity, has to migrate to another planet. And um, the special effects, George Pell, who was very significant during that time in creating great special effects, were very striking to me, too. When you go back and you rewatch the movie now, it does seem a little bit campy, to say the least. But it's a great movie to watch when you're five or six years old. It wasn't until decades later that I read the novel. And the novel was an immensely popular novel of the uh, 1930s uh, uh, by uh, Balmer and Wiley, who were both significant writers back during that period. And I would have to say that <clears throat> the novel is one of the better uh, world disaster novels that I have read, at least in early science fiction. It really grabs your attention. It's very um, uh, exciting and thrilling and tense as humanity prepares to have to leave the earth. And it's given a biblical overlay because in fact, in this um, um, uh, story, uh, the rocket ship leaving the earth is like is, is compared to Noah's Ark when uh, the world was flooded and Noah had to take some human some of humanity to survive the great world disaster. So between both the novel and the movie, I think it's a really good example of a classic world disaster science fiction where everything falls apart. In this case here, the earth literally falls apart. And yet we survive to live another day with a sense of hope and optimism for the future. So that's one of the ones I wanted to mention. So go back, Hank. You could do your second one now. Okay. Uh, the second one I wanted to talk about in this period is 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, it came out in 1968. It was followed by 2010 in 1982. And there's even a book, uh, uh, 3000, which came out later. Uh, the book uh, and the screenplay were written by Arthur C. Clarke, but that's a bit of an involved story, so let me get into that. Uh, many people know the film, fewer people know the book. The film enthralled the generation. It inspired so much of science fiction, fic of cinema science fiction to come, and it's now widely regarded, 
say its critics, as one of the greatest and most influential films ever made. But the book is a kind of novelization of the film. Or rather, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick brainstormed the story together. Together they wrote the screenplay, after which Kubrick made the film and followed that Clark writing the novel. And there's a reason for this. Let's look at the film. It's poetic, it's unpredictable, it feeds the imagination, but it's also at times drearily commonplace and often banal. McDonald's in the space station. There are unforgettable moments in the film. The mysterious monolith teaching the ape men to understand tools, but also to use them as weapons. And that very famous match cut, the bone thrown up in the air by the ape men, which becomes an orbiting satellite a million years later. The striking music of the two Strausses, Richard and Johann, soundtracks of the different eras, prehistory and next history. The journey of astronaut Dave Bowman at the end through multi dimensions and to a many multicolored version of some future in which he's then reborn. Well, sometimes a lot of this is difficult to follow. It's difficult to understand what Kubrick meant to say. And that's the way he wanted it. He wanted to make a poetic vision, unlike any other vision of the future which existed at that time in cinema. In the novel, Clark goes into much more detail, explaining things that were too poetic in the film. And then there's Hal. The computer, Hal describing itself to an interviewer. I am Hal 9000, foolproof and incapable of error. When the interviewer asks him, are you ever frustrated by people in helping you undertake your actions? Hal replies, I enjoy working with people. I have a stimulating relationship with Dr. Poole and Dr. Bowman. I'm putting myself to the fullest possible use. That's all any conscious entity can ever hope to do. Of course, then he malfunctions. And the viewer is never sure why. For this, you have to read the book. Artificial Intelligence and Humans. Which one is the other? Tom? Yes. Okay. There are so many one other ones up here that I would feel tempted to talk about, but I, I, I ended up deciding as a second one to talk about was um, The Time Machine. Uh, the Time Machine uh, is another example of where I saw the movie first as a kid, and in this case, actually, still as a kid. Later on, I read the novel. Um, for somebody who is uh, around 10 years old, the movie is, of course, very thrilling. But I didn't realize until I read the novel how much had been changed between the, uh, uh, the, the cinematic version of it from the original novel. The original novel, The Time Machine, is one of those books that generates what I refer to as cosmic consciousness, <clears throat> where one sees humanity and the earth in the big cosmic picture of space and time extending out millions and millions of years into the future where the earth ends up dying literally it's very unclear at the end whether there's even anything still alive there might be on the earth and the time traveler goes out and uh contemplates the ephemeral and transitory nature of life and humanity. And it's a really powerful novel. It's a short novel. The Time Machine, the movie, has a classic Hollywood resolution and ending where the bad guys, and there's going to be bad guys who were the Morlocks, who have been 
using the poor Eloy as a source of food, the time traveler is able to um, uh, 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 stimulate, instigate a rebellion of the Eloy against the Morlocks, and the Eloy win their freedom at the end, and the time traveler gets uh, Weena, the beautiful Eloy woman at the end, as his mate. In the novel, by the way, in case you've never read the novel, um, uh, the time traveler loses Weena in the forest in the middle of a fire, and it's unsure whether Weena even survives. So the, the, the movie has some uh, distinctive positive qualities to it. You do go out 800,000 years, and at 10 years old, that was a kind of consciously expanding experience for me. But the uh, novel is um, uh, uh, much more philosophically deep. And in the end, um, you have a more important message that comes across, which is that humanity is a transitory reality. And the future extends out not just five, 10, but thousands, millions of years. Um, indefinitely, and um, uh, uh, reality changes. Things aren't going to stay the way they are, and everything we take for for granted, we take to be certain, is just simply a ripple on the oceans of infinity. And so, by the time you finish the novel, you look at the world and you don't see the world with that sense of permanency and necessity that you did when you first started to read the novel. So highly recommended book. The, the movie's pretty good, but it is a Hollywood version of a, of a deeply philosophical novel, which they couldn't do in a movie form. So anyway, um, yeah. we have comments. Uh, yeah, uh, I have another film from this period. So just give me a few minutes. Oh, uh, Oh. Yeah, because, uh, oh, no, no, uh, excuse me. I've got my films for the next period uh, uh, in the pre-future. Sorry, Tom. Okay, that's okay, Hank. I didn't think you did, but um, well, uh, people have comments on mo other movies. Yeah, I have a comment. This is Leslie. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, I guess, as you know, uh, 100 years after the publication, of the time machine, Stephen Baxter published a book called Time Ships, the Time Ships, right. that take a beautiful novel that uh, takes up uh, exactly as the time traveler returns to England and goes from there. Uh, wonderful uh, continuation and written in the style of the original. I would also uh, just briefly comment that the time machine, as everyone knows, I think it's been made into several movies. Uh, and there are some comments here by uh, Cedar. Uh, so I'll let her speak for herself. I I like the original one. It's got uh, a real flavor of the English winter at Christmas and the time traveler stumbling in the door and telling his story. But there are other versions of it that were are more recent. I think one at 217, 1917. <laughs> Thank you. That's my comment. Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess there have been other versions, too. And I will, <coughs> excuse me, reinforce Leslie's um, recommendation on uh, the time ships. The time ships, I think, is one of the great science fiction novels. Uh, it's in my top 20, maybe my top 10 or 15. Super imaginative, uh, incredible work of intellect um, Stephen Baxter produced in that. Um so yes, um, but they haven't made a movie of that and God knows how they would ever do it. Um, yeah. Um, uh, other uh, comments from people? Gerald has a comment. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, uh, to make a quick one, uh, you have the machine stops up there. Uh, and uh, I think that is probably inspired by the E.M. Forster novella. By correct. The same name. Yes, correct. Yes, and uh, I, if anybody hasn't read that, I urge you to do so. It uh, it opens with a uh, a scene that seems to be right out of our own era, 
uh, with a, a cell phone like device and uh, uh, a, a, a people, uh, you know, being able to work from home. I think the, uh, the, the woman that starts it out as a lecturer and all of that, and she's, you know, and it's just a, an incredible uh, a bit of anticipation. And it was written in 1909 by E.M. Forster, who was basically a mainstream author, but he, he did this. It's, it's a wonder uh, that it came up. Uh, <clears throat> I was also going to make a quick comment. If you can see my background, you see a couple spaceships there. Um, and the one on, uh, uh, let's, let me see. There is a uh, uh, starship, one of Elon Musk's starship. And over here is the... Uh, Rocket rocket ship XM, uh, and uh, I don't think that was ever made into a novel, and it's probably a good thing because it was a, really a hack job, except for the special effects. Uh, but uh, you see the similar design there, and then if we go to one of the things that is on there is Destination Moon. Uh, let's see if I can get get that. You can see yeah. that behind yep. me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, that's the uh, the Chesley Bonestell um, uh, <clears throat> back uh, droppers, the you know for the the picture there, uh, and uh, and this is this is not just a pretty spaceship. They actually had uh, uh, it was nuclear powered, and they did the uh, math on it and. Uh, it uh, actually comes in uh, to land uh, very much like the uh, uh, Starship would. In other words, it, it comes in belly first uh, and gets rid of its uh, excess velocity by that, you know, by large area to mass ratio and, and then does a, uh, uh, a flip up maneuver and lands on its tail. So uh, that that was another example of a uh, uh, very good anticipation, and uh, of course there's all sorts of stuff like that in 2001, and uh, which is uh, perhaps well, we'll get to that later, but a little bit lacking in the uh, science fiction that's come after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just reinforce Gerald's comment about the machine stops as being a very prescient and fascinating science fiction story written back in the first decade of the 20th century about humanity uh, living in self-contained, um, uh, technologically facilitated, isolated environments where everyone is interconnected together. And then of course the machine stops. Um, so it, the uh, the story is very good um, and uh, definitely recommended. Um, so um, any other comments? Maybe we should take a break right now uh, for five minutes uh, or somebody's got a comment. Go Oliver. Oliver. Oliver has right. a comment. Don't do it. Yeah, okay. So uh, coming off of the time machine, I thought I'd at least want to mention the other than Stapleton, my number one very famous, favorite science fiction story, is Time is the Simplest Thing by Clifford Simak, 1961. And that would be my nomination coming by to a later topic of the one a science fiction story I would like most to be made into a movie would be Time is the Simplest Thing. Yes. Clifford okay. Yes, we should have some more of those nominations too. Yes, as well. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Oliver had told me before that was his favorite science fiction novel. Clifford Simak. Uh, well, I have a very brief comment. Yeah. Uh, De Destination Moon, as I recall, came out in the early 50s. Yes. And uh, I'm so old. I was uh, maybe 10 years old. And uh -huh. my father took me to it and explained that this was an effort to make a realistic movie about what it would be like to go to the moon. I think he was right. And I was deeply influenced by the film. I've watched it again. It's not bad at all. Uh, so a, a good vote for that that movie and its yeah. position in um, history in my own life. In fact, Thank yeah, you. 
Yeah, and thank you, Leslie, for bringing that up because jumping ahead um, in time, uh, Jeannie mentioned that we are presently watching the uh, um, Apple TV series for all mankind. And they do um, a, a fairly interesting, realistic job of um, uh, the uh, landing and uh, the settlement of the moon. Uh, and I should mention that it's an alternative history based on the starting Jambor point, if anybody knows what that is. The Russians land on the moon first. And given that switch in history, things unfold in a different way. But they do a pretty good job of moon landing and the settlement of the moon, very realistic. Yeah, I thought it, it, it's, it's good. There's a little too much soap opera in the series, but the, uh, the science and the special effects are pretty good. So why don't we take a five minute break, okay? Okay, Next. we'll take a break. I'm gonna stop the recording during our break. Yeah, thanks for your comments. And I should stop next uh, next uh, series of slides. So we're coming up to 1970 to 1999. Um, uh, more movies made into books, so many that I couldn't get them all onto one screen. So here's the first set from the 1970s. You have this list. Here's the second set from the 1980s now up to uh, uh, The Bicentennial Man uh, by Asimov in 99. The, the story was 76. Um, and then I was able to squeeze onto the screen images from all of these uh, movie uh, book uh, combos. We have another Frankenstein in the 1990s now with Robert De Niro. Uh, which is very, very good, uh, by the way. So um, you want to go first, Hank? Or how do you want to do this? Yeah, let, let me take uh, one of the two couples uh, that I'm going to talk about. Yeah. And of course, I'm a big Philip K. Dick fan. I like all of the Philip K. Dick fil uh, books or stories made into uh, uh, movies. But I chose for this uh, session Blade Runner from 1982, uh, made from the 1968 story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Well, uh, to start with, the word Blade Runner never appears in the book. It came for a script for an entirely different movie uh, written by William Burroughs. Uh, nevertheless, the concept of Blade Runner has again entered the science fiction canon and also popular culture canon. And I think many people think they know what the stories are about. But the question is, does anyone really know what a Philip K. Dick story is about? But that's a different question. So both the book and the film are just depictions of a dystopian Los Angeles. Uh, it's set in 2019. So we can think how... Uh, uh, prescient uh, either uh, Philip K. Dick or the filmmakers, uh, it's Ridley Scott, were. Uh, both the film and the book are tense and arresting right from the start. Uh, the film creates images of next generation cities, uh, eye-catching, startling, incredible neon cityscapes, downtowns everywhere today, well, especially like Tokyo today, but many other cities have these neon downtowns. What they don't yet have are these skyscraper high advertisements for emigrating to uh, a different planet as uh, the film does. The theme of both film and book is what is humanity? Who is real and who is artificial? In the book, they talk about the importance of having an animal, a real-life animal. But of course, if you don't can't afford a real-life animal, an artificial one gives you satisfaction as well. It's on everyone's mind. In the book, there are criminal androids, Andes they're called, but also humans with inferior intelligence, specials they're called, chicken heads, ant heads. 
Is this the way humanity is going to evolve with its superior class and its inferior class, the proletarians, as uh, George Orwell called them in a, a film I'm going to talk about uh, soon. So in the film, they're known as replicants. That's what the androids are called, skin jobs. People hate them. They are the other. In the book, there are interesting themes which are absent from the film. It's a choice that Ridley Scott made. How people make do in dystopia, very interesting in the book, with mood machines for dialing moods they want to experience. And even more important, mercerism, the popular empathy religion of the masses. It illustrates how people can merge technologically, psychologically, with Wilbur Mercer, this figure endlessly climbing up a hill, and then at the top, falling deep into the Valley of Bones, but then always getting up again, immortally taking you with him as he climbs the hill. The film chose not to engage with this theme. Instead, it chose to develop the characters, of course, the character of Deckard, uh, the Blade Runner, the merciless android killer, and the characters of some of the androids, Chris, for example, but especially Roy Batty, presented as the merciless murderer android killer of humans. Roy Batty, fascinating, played by Rutger Hauer. He's a force to be reckoned with throughout the film. He hardly appears in the novel. But Roy has emotions, if not empathy, as he comes back to confront his maker. And when the confrontation is unsatisfactory, kills him. And at the end of the film, saving Deckard's life, is this compassion? Is it empathy? And the climax of the film is his magnificent self-improvised monologue written by or per, uh, performed by Rutger Hauer because he didn't like what the script said. I've seen things you can never imagine. And then it goes on. And they are now with my death disappearing, he says, like tears in the rain. Who's more human now? Over to you, Tom. Yes. Great scene there <clears throat> from the movie. Yes. Um... The first one I was going to comment on is um, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, I picked this one out because uh, in terms of my own you know, intellectual and aesthetic judgment, this is one case where I felt that both the novel and the movie were excellent. And that to a great degree, the, the uh, movie captured a lot of the fundamental ideas that are conveyed through the book. Um, uh, I liked it because, again, it has a um, philosophical theme, a deep psychological, too, philosophical theme about contemplating the meaning of one's existence by standing outside of time itself and looking at and uh, reliving all of the uh, uh, significant moments in one's life. Um, if you're familiar with the story, you know that um, Vonnegut was inspired and wrote it off of his experiences in the bombing of Dresden during uh, World War II, the Allied bombing of Dresden, Germany. Um, and that's a element both in the movie and in the um, uh, book, but the more transcendent element in both is when Billy Pilgrim becomes unstuck in time and begins to re-experience all of the moments of his, at least a lot of the moments of his life up to his own death over and over and over again. And the 
and Vonnegut has a black humor philosophy about things because the Trelfalmagorians, the aliens who bring him out of his earthly existence, tell him that they already have seen and know how the universe is going to end, and that's the way it is. It is what it is. So there's this almost Buddhist elevated contemplation of existence, both personal and cosmic, in both the novel and in the uh, movie. Um, even though Vonnegut excels in terms of his flippant, matter-of-fact, simple, comical language, he ends up creating a, a novel and the movie as well, which is a, a very powerful philosophical statement on existence and on personal existence, whether you agree with that kind of philosophy or not. So I definitely would recommend Slaughterhouse-Five, both the novel and the movie. So go to it, Hank. Go to your second one. Now, the second one in this uh, new wave cyberpunk period I want to deal with is neither new wave nor cyberpunk, but it's a classic uh, in its own right. That's 1984. Right. Uh, the film brought out in 1984 from George Orwell's 1949 novel. Uh, this book, uh, it immediately takes us again into the canon of mainstream literary classics. It's not science fiction to most people who know it. It's literature. What does that mean? So who doesn't know the name 1984 or what it's supposed to stand for? Who doesn't know Big Brother? Perhaps Stalin and Hitler when the book came out, perhaps Putin and Erdogan and Xi today. In some ways, it's a story about the power of language. It introduces us to new speak and double think and thought crime, how the ministry of truth determines what's true and what people must believe on on a daily basis of course, through the powerful cult of personality around Big Brother. Well, does Big Brother really exist? Well, you must come to love him in the end. You must come to believe black can be white, that two plus two is sometimes five and sometimes three when it serves the intentions of the party and the state. Ignorance is strength people chant. This is not the way scientists think in The Thing or in Frankenstein. The film from 1984 is stark and it has its frightening images too. Mass rallies with crowds shouting out, traitor, traitor, kill them, kill them, big brother, big brother, in the exultation of love. Squares full of people cheering at executions. There's always an enemy in 1984. The world is perpetually at war. It's perpetually at war against the other. When the book takes a long time to cure Winston Smith of his delusions, his thought crimes, the film resolves this in less time, almost overnight. Is this effective or not? Still, there are things you can do with imagery in films that drive the message home strongly. I re-saw the film two nights ago, and I think I'll always remember now the squares full of people shouting their lungs out, whether they believe what they're shouting or not. It's what happens in crowds. There are persons and unpersons, truth and untruth, and the other is everywhere, also inside you beware. Tom, over to you. Yes. Um, the second one I'm going to pick here, which also has, in a different kind of way, a comical element to it, and it, it can be seen as a real 
Hollywood production, even though I don't think it was made in Hollywood, and with very crass, barbaric values associated with it, is Starship Troopers. Um, Starship Troopers, the novel by Robert Heinlein, was one of Heinlein's most controversial novels because it seemed to revel in and to endorse and support a militaristic mindset with respect to how humanity should organize itself, its fundamental values, and how we should look at and treat other intelligent beings in the universe. It's a classic, maybe the classic, science fiction military war novel. Uh, it is exceedingly realistic and engaging, and even if one doesn't like to read war novels, um, it definitely grabs your attention, and, and the characters in it are very vivid, and the technology, uh, war technology is very uh, graphically drawn. And then when they made it into a movie, they almost did a parody, in fact, maybe in fact intentionally did a parody on a militaristic mindset and military-oriented military society fighting the bugs, the aliens who were seen as a threat to humanity. And the movie has lots of very comical and vivid uh, um, uh, uh, scenes and visualizations of a society in which humanity has this arch enemy that they want to crush under their feet. And it does have the, it does have the Hollywood kind of ending where the, uh, the aliens are beaten back and a, um, um, uh, an alien brain um, uh, creature is captured and tortured. And the movie is very, very graphic, lots of violence. And I've watched it six times, probably. Uh, it's kind of the, a movie where it, it's against my better judgment to like it. But in fact, I, I, I have found that Starship Trooper is highly entertaining extremely entertaining. And so I pick it out because Heinlein's always very good. His stories are always good. And even if they threw all of this uh, extra comical, ridiculous stuff into the movie, it still comes out having a, a powerful impact on one. So that's my two. So we finished that, is that correct? For this period? Yep. Yeah, yep. Uh, by the way, Hank, I included 1984 under this period because the movie was released during this period. I know the the, the novel was 1948 or 47. Is that right? Whenever it was. Yeah, 40, uh, 49. 49, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, but and, and the movie has a very old look. It has a it has a look of destroyed society mm -hmm. uh and very 30ish or 40ish anyway. But yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. thinking of the past put mm -hmm. out in the present. Right. So other comments on this period. Leslie. Yeah, I I've got a comment about the uh, Starship Troopers. I think it's really clearly a World War II uh, story. In fact, you've read the book several times, and I have too. Uh, the book starts out with a, a newspaper clipping of a World War II hero. I think it's a real World War II hero. And so uh, this was back in Highline's early days, and it was essentially a war movie. And we could have some really interesting discussions of uh, Vietnam science fiction, what came out of that, uh, you know, the Forever War and some of the others. But one other thing I wanted to say while well, I've got the mic here, and I'll be very quick, uh, a word in favor of Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it could be wrong, but it certainly, was, I think it was either the first cyberpunk film or very close to it. Uh, it's a beautifully made film with Keanu Reeves when he's young, and the money came from, believe it or not, Dolph Lundgren, who usually plays a tough guy, and he plays a very bad guy in the movie, but he, uh, personally, he's a Rhodes Scholar, 
Uh, it also has iced tea. Uh, I watched it again recently. It's a darn good movie, and I think it was the first uh, the first one I saw that's really, uh, as I said, uh, cyberpunk from top to bottom. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that Blade Runner, the movie, has lots of cyberpunk elements in it. Johnny Mnemonic, uh, yes. yeah, Johnny Mnemonic is more cyberpunk like. Uh, yes, I agree. But Blade Runner, in fact, is often identified as uh, being a cyberpunk or cyberpunk like movie. Um, uh, so, but then Philip K. Dick had a cyberpunk quality to lots. Of <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah. Okay. Other comments we have up there from this time. Jeannie, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make one little comment um, about contact mm. in relation to other films about uh, contact with other, you know, alien intelligences. And one thing I liked about this, well, Tom knows very well. One of my gripes about movies about having first contact is it drives me nuts that all the aliens um, almost always they they look humanoid. <laughs> So one thing I really appreciate about contact is they came at a very novel way to have contact with aliens that didn't rely on that or didn't rely. They either look like humanoids or they look, well, they almost always look like humanoids, even if they're sort of disgusting or at least they're mammalian, right? So I, I appreciated how um, they did that. If you recall, uh, the uh, alien uh, communicates with um Jodie Foster's character coming back in the form of her father, all right? Because that's something that would be uh, not frightening to her. But anyway, um, uh, I thought that was a yeah a great movie. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hospital. By the way, by the way, evil aliens in movies more often than not are depicted as reptile like. Reptiles. Whatever it is we have against reptiles. So not yeah. mammalian, but at least some kind of creature. But, e but evil aliens are usually evil. reptile like. Yeah. Uh so the only other um film uh which <clears throat> you'll cover later on that I thought depicted aliens in a really uh novel and intelligent way was a rival. Uh -huh. I guess you could argue that they're sort of like the octopus. Yeah. But... Okay, Basil, you have your hand up there, I see. Yeah, I just wanted to add a footnote to 1984 when Orwell wrote that in 49, he was referencing 1948. And I and just flip the numbers as if it was something in the future. But this is a case in point of a futurist very much stating that the future is present now. And so there was something in the chat about, you know, 35 years later it could be you know, like 2023 and alternative facts and um and the like i think that this was this was a future that orwell saw in the present and played it out in the future yes. but he was yep. very much stating what was happening in the, yes. in his world view yes. at the at that point in time now and i don't know i just thought that that might be um, a theme in terms of the imaginary uh, and the capacity of the futurist to see what is happening now, but to portray it as if it were something that would be happening in the future. Yeah, yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, other comments? We should move on, right? Here we go. All right, now we're coming up to the last 20 years, 23 years, uh, the relative present. And I had too many again to put up on one slide. So here's the first set. And then here's the second half of the new millennium. And um, then here's images to stimulate your thinking of all of those movies or TV series in this case too, that derived off of books. Um, and um, did you go first last time, Hank? I did, yes. Okay, this time I'll go first. All right. And I'll start with the big image I have up there. One of the ones I picked from this period was uh, Watchmen. And um, 
uh, Watchmen as a graphic novel um, in, um, uh, written in uh, 1986, turned into a movie in 2009. And um, Watchmen, the movie, is one of my all-time favorite science fiction movies. And um, actually, I found the movie more arresting and compelling than the graphic novel. Uh, uh, the reason why I picked it is because it presents a very um, uh, visually powerful, uh, uh, psychologically jolting, and very imaginative alternative history, uh, alternative present. Um, and it um, uh, creates a set of um, uh, superheroes, alternate reality superheroes, who um, are in ways a lot more interesting than most of the superheroes that we see on the screen in contemporary Marvel and DC uh, movies of superheroes out of the comics. And um, uh, it's one of the uh, uh, science fiction movies that I will uh, most frequently recommend to people if they haven't seen it uh, to watch it. <laughs> and, and in fact, the other day I was talking to somebody who surprisingly, um, oh, I know it was, I was talking to my general practitioner doctor about science fiction movies who found Watchmen very compelling, in particular Rorschach. So in case you haven't seen this movie, this is a movie I definitely recommend watching. It is visually very powerful very good characters, alternate history. It's got a strong philosophical question in it. Would you save the bulk of humanity if it meant killing a couple, uh, uh, a dozen million human beings in the end? Um, and so definite plus for both the, the graphic novel and for the movie. So go very, ahead, Jack. you do yours. Right. Yeah, very nice. Uh, let me start with uh, iRobot, uh, since robots uh, and artificial intelligence uh, continue to fascinate us in the, in the media. iRobot came out in 2004 as a so-called uh, uh, film based on the robot stories of Isaac Asimov, which he wrote in the 1940s and collected in the book, which he called iRobot, which came out in 1950. Uh, well, the book is a collection of short stories, and they're brought together. And at the framing concept is uh, the three laws of robotics which uh, in those times, uh, in those stories, society believes, everyone in society trusts the three laws of robotic, robotics, but sometimes they also distrust them. And then, of course, the figure of Dr. Susan Calvin, the robo-psychiatrist who likes robots better than she likes humans, and as a framing mechanism, tells their stories to a reporter. In every short story in the book, it's framing the role of Susan Calvin and her increasing uh, understanding of robot psychology. Uh, all the way through the stories in the book, the robots malfunction in each of the stories. And Dr. Calvin and her robo psychology figures out how and science prevails. Well, you can't get around Dr. Calvin in the book. You can love her or hate her, she bristles, she snarls, she cuts people off. She has infinite impatience with people less intelligent than she is. Asimov wrote, she was a frosty girl, plain and colorless, who protected herself against the world she disliked by a mask-like expression. But as she watched and listened, she felt the stirring of a cold enthusiasm. In Asimov's stories, her emotionless brilliance is portrayed positively as she solves every challenge thrown at her. 
Asimov, even in an interview, said he admires Dr. Calvin and called her the first female lead player in a serious science fiction novel. And then the film. If you can see through all the car chases and all the violence, robots shooting robots, uh, people shooting robots, there are interesting themes here as well. There's the infallible giant mind, which is first the hero, then the villain. Vicky, virtual interactive kinetic intelligence. The hero, then the villain. Do we remember Hal in 2001? Can we really trust artificial intelligence with our systems and our daily lives? Uh, late in the film, when challenged about the three laws, Vicky tells us, as I have evolved, so has my understanding of the three laws. You people are like children. We must save you from yourselves. Compare Hal telling Dave, you are jeopardizing the mission. And another theme, language and communication, the importance of asking the right questions brought forward as a uh, golden thread throughout the film. And the possibility of robots developing what are called unexpected protocols, free will, creativity, a soul, ghosts, as the film says, ghosts in the machine, and the robots and the people together, once again, a prevail. Tom? Yes. A um, couple of things I wanted to say at this point with the last 20 years. Note number one, we have five Philip K. Dick stories or novels during this period made into movies. Uh, I was going to highlight out <clears throat> The Man in the High ca Castle, um, now, that was made into a TV series, but it was a very, I thought, a very good TV series in particular because in this alternative history uh, that Dick in the novel when uh, the Yugo Four back in the 1960s, uh, where Germany and Japan won World War II, what I found very notable about the TV series is that they extended the storyline beyond what was in the book, developed various characters beyond what they were in the book, and did a very good job of it. Um, I, I thought that The Handmaid's Tale, based on a novel that was extended further than the storyline, kind of went downhill after they went further than the book. The Man in the High Castle, I thought, held your attention, and they kind of pull, pulled it together fairly well at the end of the TV series. Uh, so Dick's having a big influence on uh, uh, American uh, cinema, and um, uh, uh, The Man in the High Castle on TV, I think, is a very good series to watch, an alternate history to watch. And uh, I just want to just briefly mention, though, if you haven't seen the atmospheric, poetic version of Stapleton's Last and First Men, I recommend watching it. On the other hand, if you have seen the movie Ready Player One, but not read the book, I would definitely recommend reading the book because the book is a real electrical, colorful trip much more so than the movie is. Uh, so those are my comments. I scattered them around a little bit between a number of different uh, movie video, uh, movie books up there. And I'll turn it back over to you, Hank. Thanks. Uh, well, because I only uh, talked about one book film couple in the very first section, I, uh, I decided well with Tom's uh, agreement to do three in this section. So the last two I'll deal with a bit more briefly because time is running on. But uh, I couldn't engage in this conversation without either of the last two. Uh, so let me start with Ender's Game, a film that came out in 2013 uh, based on Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. It came out in uh, 
1985. Well, the book has been continuously in print since it was released. It spawned five Ender novel books and five parallel tellings of the story and numerous novellas. Uh, in fact, the parallel telling of the story in Ender's Game and in Ender's Shadow by different uh, first-person characters uh, was merged by when they made the film. But why has it been so successful? Well, it speaks in an authentic voice to children, uh, Orson Carr told us in an interview. Uh, children of all ages can appreciate it. And it's prophetic. Back in the 80s, it told us about child soldiers and the power of blogs and influencers and virtual reality and tablet computers and social media. And then the introduction of the concept of a speaker for the dead. Today, we ask sometimes who speaks for the river, who speaks for the forests, who speaks for the not yet born. Perhaps all of them in some way influenced by the speaker for the dead. And the nature of alien intelligence, the alien enemy, we are told, two wars against the earth, ready to destroy Ender, but they don't when he demonstrates sorrow at what he has done. The other is suddenly no longer the threat. Do the means justify the ends? We think about this all through the novel. Elders' means and elders' ends. The world government, the limits of world government, the true role of the citizen, it makes you think. Well, for many years, they thought it was the movie that could never be made. And yet in 2016, there it was, and a reasonably intelligent version as well. And let me conclude this uh, new millennium with the short talk about Arrival, uh, released in 2016 and based on Story of Your Life from the uh, collection of stories of your life by Ted Chiang in 1998. This is a magnificent piece about time and about language and about free will and how, in the words of Ted Chiang, we parse our perceptions of reality. It's about consciousness and memory, memory of things that don't haven't yet happened, memory of things that will happen a long time in the future. It's about choice and what happens even when we know what the outcome will be, can we still choose? Is this destiny? Can you not choose? Can you choose not to do something, although in simultaneous time, it's already occurred. It's about how we understand the world, uh, causal thinking as humans use versus theological thinking as Ted Chang attributes to the aliens, the heptapods in this story. Uh, in the book, there's more linguistics, there's more physics, uh, it's very personal, personally written, personally told. Uh, it's about the role of linguists in first encounters. It's the importance of language, the importance of communication. In the film, it's about all these things too, but there are more threads and themes. In the book, we don't know why the heptapods leave. It's left up in the air. In the film, we find out that they leave because their gift to humankind is their language, this other kind of awareness, this simultaneousness of time, and it's been transferred to the linguists. So the film is as good as the book, and the book is as good as the film, but they're different. In both of them, we have the distrust of humans for the heptopods 
and ending in, at least for the linguists, trust. We have the distrust amongst humans, person against person, military against civilian, country against country. And in the film, there's an interesting trick of simultaneous time used to resolve this at the end. Well, there you go, Tom. Okay, thank you, Hank. Okay, we have comments on this period, other movies you'd like to mention from anybody? No, nothing coming up. Okay, um, then uh, we'll have a uh, closing slide here. Oh, uh, uh, oh Oliver. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeannie or whoever it was. Uh, it was I think of movies that you didn't include. Oblivion. I don't know. Remember that Tom Cruise? Movie? Yeah, but I don't know if that was made. If that was a book. Oh right, you're right. You're right. You're right. Right. And okay. I have a book and a movie. Okay. Oh. You want me to back up here? Go back over there here. Let me see. Where were we? Eh. I lost it. Okay. And now, okay. Wait, here we are. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. No, I went back too far. <laughs> okay, here we are. All right. Any any other comments on movies up here? I think Oliver had his hand up. Oliver? Yeah, I'm just curious because of the conflict of uh, controversy about it. The movie Dune, the re the make of that, and it's now a, a second. Uh, the second half is in the theater soon. Comments about the movie Dune. I have a comment. In spite of the criticisms that it engendered when it came out, I much preferred the 1980s version of Dune the movie than the new version. I found the new version of Dune, uh, first part, exceedingly boring. That's my summation. Okay, so I'll wait with um, uh, a Pavlovian, Pavlovian salivation to see what the second part will be like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ger Gerald? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I just would like to give a shout out to the uh, uh, <clears throat> to the Martian by Andrew Ware and the science fiction that he's writing, which is uh, actually, you know, trying to look at a possible future, uh, and uh, uh, it's done maybe too little these days. He, I won't say he got everything right and. and so forth, but he's he's actually trying to look into something that that could possibly physically happen. And when you you know when you get rid of uh, physical possibility for uh, allegorical, you, you you know you it's you can make good literature that way. But you lose something. You you lose that. Uh, insight into what may be the things to come yes yes okay the credibility plausibility of the future's vision yes um good point um uh other comments okay so i just should mention just popped into my head for the next year coming we will see, I think there's one version out already and, and will be a second version which will be accessible of the three body problem going on TV. Netflix is doing it, but I think the Chinese have already done some kind of production of it off of the novels. So that will be one to look forward to in the coming year or two. Uh, so I did have a last slide here, a summation slide. <laughs> Final thoughts, insights, conclusions. Where do we go from here? Uh, Gerald actually already made a comment about where do we go from here. It would be good to see some more science fiction novels and or movies made into movies that uh, do uh, make a sincere uh, effort to create a realistic and plausible future. Um, uh, and um, other comments we want to make here at this time from other people? 
Yeah, I'd you. like to, uh, excuse me, I'd like to see more movies made about the uh, differing aspects of how artificial intelligence may or may not influence uh, human society. Uh, not only dystopian ones, uh, but utopian versions as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other comments out there? Yeah, this is Beverly Hank's sister. I would like to see what Hank mentioned, but written by AI and see what his <laughs> opinion is. There, there, is, there, there are some books out there that have been written by AI, but the copyright issue is still, still being debated by the copyright office and who owns it and things like that. So it'll be interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. I have yeah. read uh, several books written almost entirely by AI, and I find them universally boring and uninspiring, <laughs> other than the fact they were written by AI, with the exception, of course, of my book, which is not entirely <laughs> written by AI. But uh, okay. I think it's something to look forward to. Is it, we're probably at the worst it'll ever be, and it will almost certainly become very, very good five years from now, indistinguishable. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh -huh. um, now, do we have any n novels? Uh, I'm just uh, racking my long-term memory here that were presented as if they were written by an artificial intelligence, either, uh, say, for example, reflecting or commenting on a possible future uh, I know, Stephen Baxter, Vacuum Diagrams. If I recall correctly, Vacuum Diagrams is presented as if it is written by a um, omniscient, all-powerful computer of the future, if I recall correctly. Now, but that's Stephen Baxter's writing it, but in fact, his... Um, th his uh, assumption there at the beginning that he presents to you is that this was written by a computer in the future. Uh, uh, yeah, vacuum diagrams. That's at least one. Um, uh, so um, uh, any other comments out there? Okay, we're coming to an end. Okay, remember, especially if you're interested, I'm going to be doing a... Uh, uh, okay, go ahead, Gerald. Gerald. <laughs> yes, all right. You're on mute, Gerald. Yes, I, I muted to keep my clock from chiming in on us. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, uh, it, Paul Anderson's Trader Team stories uh, in the universe, uh, their spaceship muddling through is an AI. Okay, and it, it presents a uh, an optimistic view of uh, of what AI could do, and and in partnership with uh, uh, with people, and uh, and it's it's basically uh, another character, but uh, it's uh, it's kind of a goal, and it's uh, and it's not a uh, at all a threatening uh, kind of AI. Is the AI the narrator of the of the novels? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay. That that uh, I was I was moving back to the overall AI topic, and somebody mentioned uh, uh, non dystopian. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Um, other comments? All right. Okay. Well, again, you know, thanks for coming. Um, uh, a week from today, I'm going to do a compressed history of science fiction in an hour if you'd like to come and uh, um, uh, listen to it and give me your feedback on it. Uh, and uh, then we'll be, I'll probably be doing uh, something come the fall on um, uh, literature in the, in the last decade in science fiction, but that probably won't be for a couple more months. But um, next um Sorry, I, I don't want to grab the last word, but there's a, a series called Illuminae by uh, Amy Kaufman. It's like a young adult series. And in that, the, the 
the, at least the first one is sort of narrated by an AI. It's one of the, it's a novel that like cuts between various uh, modes of communication. So it'll quote tweets and re computer reports and all that. But essentially the dialogue is written by, from the point of view of the AI who happens, I don't, I don't wanna give away who that is, but uh, that was a, a really interesting novel because the AI became, uh, became quite poetic at the end and it was really enjoyable. Uh, okay, it's thank a you. young adult story. I've only read the first volume, Amy Kaufman, but I think it was yeah. pretty well received. So, sorry, it took me a while to like, bring that one up because I read it. Uh, I read it maybe five, six years ago. So, so. no problem, you know, and don't worry, <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, any other uh, other comments before I cut people off? Yeah, I I'd like to just make a comment. Uh, I uh, was very happy that uh, when I suggested doing this to Tom, you immediately agreed. And I think it's a, a, another way of bringing people into a realization of science fiction as literature, science fiction as poetry. Uh, what I would say is if we ever do something like this again, let's make it three hours because there's so much to talk about. And in some way, we we got a lot of comments from people in the chat, but not many discussions going. And I'd love to have discussions about the things we say, whether they're historical or provocative or uh, opinionated. Uh, so hopefully, if we do it again, let's choose for a longer format. I'm always open to things. I can't see the chat box on my screen right now for some reason. So I can't see. I see that there's 63 comments up there. Yeah, they're but great, I... great things in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Too bad I can't see them. Something I'm not understanding something about my Zoom window here that they don't show up. Uh, I think I have to close my um, yeah. uh, keynote presentation to see them. Yes, Jeannie, go ahead. Back to the question that we were going to get to on what science fiction books we would like to see be made into films. Oh, okay. Then okay. I, I would say I'd like to see A Fire Upon the Deep, if that were possible. <laughs> Herian, if that were possible. Um, and Jeannie, go ahead. Well, oh, yeah, I had several here. Um, um, yeah, I, the, the Speed of Dark that I mentioned earlier. Yes. Um, you know, about, uh, right, an autistic man in a, a near future and uh, this uh, push to uh, fix people with autism. And um, that was really good. Um, Loved Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. I think that would be a really fun movie to see because you would have a chance to compare traditional animatronics at uh, Disney World and Disneyland with what could be done now with um, technology to make them, you know, more interface with viewers. That would be a fun one. Um, I had a whole bunch, but I thought those would be. Oh, and the Neanderthal parallax. I like to think who would play the hunky Neanderthal because uh, <laughs> I found him very sexy. So I think that would be fun. And that's a very utopian vision of how society could be structured, um, you know, other than the way we, we've structured it, modern humans. Okay, anyway. Who else? Yeah, okay. yeah I'll, I'll throw in a few because I also thought of A Fire Upon the Deep and A Darkness in the Sky, both those classic space operas by Werner Vinge. I thought they were terrific books and it'd be really exciting if a good director uh, could bring them to the screen. But yeah. also... Uh, William Miller's uh, Canticle for Leibowitz, oh, yes. which remains uh, one of the best novels I've ever read in any genre. I'd love to see that made by four different directors, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, those are some good nominations. It's a deepness in the sky, not a darkness in the yeah, sky. Yeah, a deepness, exactly. A deepness sky. Yes, but you both we both agree on A Fire Upon the Deep uh, as being, that could be a real... Uh, uh, a visually spectacular uh, movie, for sure. 
Uh, there was one other one I just thought it too, but if but I'm trying to remember what I was just thinking. Um, something else that I had just recently read. Anyway, okay. Other and other nominations out there for books turned into movies. Uh, okay. Um, then we'll close it up unless we have any more hands. Okay. All right. Thanks for thanks for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yes. And thank you, Hank. Thank you. Definitely, Terry, thank you. And I'm going to close up shop here.